Welcome to How to Read the Bible Like a Human Being. Today we're going to be talking about imagination. And we want to try to answer the question, is it really okay to make up stuff about the Bible? I mean, these are the holy scriptures. They're the sacred texts. Is it really okay to make up details? This is something that people get stuck on. So I want to talk about why we do that what the boundaries are around it, and how you can talk to your people so they can get over their emotional obstacles to this. So first off, the goal of making up details, well, I'm calling it making up details, but we're adding in what's most likely in terms of visual details to the scene. So the goal is that we can identify with the people in Scripture. So let me give you an example. Let's take the man of the tombs, the demoniac at Kersey. So once he, Jesus casts the demons out of him, the crowd a couple hours later returns and they see this guy. And the Bible gives us three details about him. He's sitting there, he's clothed, and he's in his right mind. So envision that picture for a minute. What do you see when you see this man seated? clothed and in his right mind. And most of us don't see much because <laughs> we've never really tried to envision this and we don't have good pictures of biblical scenes in our heads. So I like to envision him seated on a log. They were probably, you know, they were pulling the boat up to shore. It was either in town or out you know, on the beach somewhere, and my best guess is it was on the beach. So they pulled the boat up onto the beach, tied it off to a tree, and they're out in the country, so where are they sitting? Well, probably on some log that washed up on the shore of the sea or something. So there's where they're sitting, Jesus and the guy facing each other, and they're on the same log, so they're sort of turned, you know, sideways. And this man is clothed. So what does that mean? Well, the kind of clothes people wore in those days, the, the shirt was the kitan, was a kind of a tunic. It was a piece of fabric that went up and over the back and had a hole cut out for your neck. And then you put a linen belt around it. It would have been made of linen. So this guy's wearing a shirt. Where did he get the shirt? There's nobody else around except Jesus and the disciples. So it's very likely that's where he got this shirt that he's wearing is from one of Jesus's party. Now, clothes were really expensive in those days. So one of the disciples gave him his spare shirt. And most people only had two or at most three sets of clothing. So when this disciple gave a shirt, maybe it was even Jesus gave his extra shirt, but whoever gave the extra shirt they probably got left with only one shirt. <laughs> that was the only piece of clothing they had left was that one outfit. So when you think about this guy sitting there on the log, there was a big sacrifice that somebody made so he could be clothed. A shirt might have taken, I calculated this out at one point, it took over a hundred hours to grow the flax and make the linen and spin the thread and so somebody just gave this guy a hundred plus hours of labor, a shirt. There was a huge sacrifice involved in this. And if you don't think about the details, if you don't try to picture it, you don't know that. Because in our culture, a shirt is, you know, 20 bucks. And <laughs> yeah, maybe it takes a half an hour or an hour of my time to earn enough money to buy that shirt. And it's no really big deal because I've got 15 more in my closet. So knowing the details, I want to imagine this poor disciple who just had a near-death experience right before this is the stilling of the storm. So this guy was out in the middle of the lake in a fierce windstorm thinking he was going to die. He's traumatized. He comes back. Then this naked, screaming lunatic comes running down to the beach. And 15 minutes later, Jesus says, hey, can I have that extra shirt you got? So it's been quite a day for this disciple. And I want to try to think about what was he feeling? What was he thinking when he gave that? 
was he used to it by now? Was it hard? It would have been hard for me. Um, so these kind of details help us identify with the person because we can start to feel what they feel, think what they think, and experience what they experience. Missed. So that's what we're attempting to do here is our goal is to identify with these people. And to identify, we have to feel what they feel, think what they thought, experience what they experienced. And the reason for that is that's the way your emotional brain makes connections. Your rational brain is fine standing back at a distance and analyzing the situation, but your emotional brain needs to have an experience in my life that I can equate to this person in order to make that connection. So the more we can visualize it, the easier it is for our emotional brains to connect and say, oh, I felt that one time Jesus asked me to give away my guitar, and that was really important to me. That's the feeling that disciple probably had. Uh, or, <laughs> you know, you come up and see this guy who's been the screaming lunatic that everyone's afraid of, and he's clothed and saying, what are you thinking? Well, maybe somebody that was really wild in high school you meet them several years later and they're all cleaned up and they've got a good job and okay that's what the crowd was feeling like so those are the connections that we're after and what we're trying to to do here we're making up we're making up we're filling in the visual details that are missing because the narrator of that story only gives us three details we got to come up with an entire scene, and he's only given us three little things. So there's a lot of ground to fill in there. Uh, here's another example. This man comes, the disciples pull the boat up to shore, they're tying it off, and all of a sudden the screaming lunatic comes. Um, he'd been living among the tombs. Well, here, let's read what, what Mark says about that. This is in Mark 5. Um, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, even with a chain. For he'd often been bound with fetters and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart and the fetters he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and bruising himself with stones. Okay, so let's envision that for a minute here. We've got a fair number of details, but they're not really fleshed out. And we tend to sort of read over that and think, okay, this guy was in really bad shape. But let's actually try to picture it. Take the part where he bruises or gashes himself with stones. The Greek word is actually deep cuts is what it implies. So you've got a guy who's been sleeping on the ground, on the dirt, um, without any clothes on, not washing, undernourished, and he has cuts all over his body. What happens to your cuts in that situation? You don't have a Band-Aid on them. <laughs> There's no dressing because you've got no clothes. You've got no fabric. So they stay as open wounds. Some of them get infected. Um, some of them, you know, there's maybe they scab over, but there's pus and stuff coming out of it. Some of them, maybe they've got flies on them. This guy stinks. He hasn't taken a bath in weeks. His hair is all ratty. There's probably stuff stuck in his hair and in his beard. Uh, he's not nice to look at. And he's not been sleeping well. He's What's he been eating out there? Grass? Stuff that he steals from the village? He's undernourished. Uh, if you're outside unclothed every night, you probably get sick. So he probably has a cough that doesn't go away. Now, we don't know any of those details, but we know that he was living outdoors and he was tormented by these demons and cutting himself with stones. So here are some of the natural implications of what that might mean. So we're filling in the details, but we're doing it in a structured way we're doing it we're trying to be accurate as we can 
We can't be totally accurate because it doesn't just say his cuts were infected, but we can make a guess that if you're living in the dirt without clothes on and not taking care of yourself, that that's going to happen. So this is the kind of thing that we're doing. We're not making up stuff out of whole cloth. We're trying to say in this culture, in this time, what would life have been like for these people? And a key to communicating this to your group is we're making pictures, we're not making doctrine. That's a really good phrase. We're not making up details like, oh, there's four gods instead of one. No. <laughs> we're going to use good, solid, biblical doctrine. But then when it comes to visualizing, we'll fill in the gaps so we have a nice, rich picture that we can put ourselves into. So we're, and we're going to do the best job we can. We're going to research the archaeology. We're going to look at the culture and what Jewish culture was like. We're going to look at material culture, the objects of everyday life. We're going to do the best we can and fill in the details in a way that makes sense to us. And the other thing about this is the stuff we make up is not scripture. The, the details we fill in are not sacred. They're just helping us picture the story. So if we get better information later, big whoop, um, we just change our story. So for instance, I had a guy who wrote a, a really good narrative. And one place in his narrative, he had the a house in Capernaum. It was Jairus. And he had Jairus' house up on a hill so Jairus could see Jesus' boat coming. Well, you know, there's no hill in Capernaum. It's pretty much flat. So he was like, oh, and he changed it. Jairus was up on the roof that morning and he saw Jesus' boat coming. Okay, well, that works. Uh, so that we hold those things lightly. It's, it's a picture. It's not a religion. So people are going to be challenged by this because they're not used to having permission to imagine when it comes to the Bible. We've, we're used to studying it as theology. And when you're doing theology, you don't want to imagine things and fill in the details. You want to do exactly what it says. And But when you're visualizing, it's a totally different ballgame. So if you can help people make that distinction between pictures and theology, that will help them feel more free to do this.